Station. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try and I try. Hello and welcome to Call to Action, the go-to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing and advertising. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp, and I'm Giles Edwards, co-founder and MD. Today, I've caught Vicky Ross. One of the best copywriters in the business, Vicky specialises in branding and tone of voice, running workshops all over the globe and creating voices for some of the UK's biggest brands, including The Body Shop, Sky, ITV and Virgin Media. She dedicates time to mentoring budding creatives and is a very vocal champion of the art of copywriting itself. Vicky says it will take you further than you imagined into people's homes, onto high streets and on shoots around the world. Welcome to the show, Vicky. Hi, thanks. Right, a... Slightly different quickfire warm-up this time. Seeing as words are your thing, we've created a World Cup of Words. We've already had intensive rounds of qualifiers and arguments at GASP, and we have eight words remaining. So the process remains. I'll put two words to you, and you choose the strongest one to go through to face the next. And at the end, we'll have a winning word. Um, And we'll also know if we should ever meddle with the warm-up process again. So... (laughs) Make sense? Yeah, as long as I don't need to know anything about football, we're fine. No, no, you're good there. You're good. So, poppycock or flabbergasted? Flabbergasted. Flabbergasted or buffoon? Flabbergasted. Flabbergasted or gubbins? Flabbergasted. Flabbergasted or swashbuckling? Oh, that's a good one. Swashbuckling. Swashbuckling or scallywag? Huh. Scallywag. Scallywag or bamboozle? Uh, why is this so hard? I'm very indecisive. <laughs> um, bamboozle. Bamboozle or onomatopoeia? Oh, bamboozle. Bamboozle's the winner. Great. Is that, are we done? We're done. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, there's a ceremony to attend later this evening where bamboozle wins and, I don't know, something happens with a cup. We get bamboozled. <laughs> yeah, we get bamboozled. <laughs> I think uh, it's both reassuring and important to hear that talented people in our industry don't just step out of a shiny university straight into a shiny agency. So can you tell us about your first ever job and your first ever copywriting job? Yeah. Um, so my, I think my first ever job was a Saturday girl as a hairdresser when I was about 13. And um, I thought I wanted to be a hairdresser after that. Um, and I won't go into like every Saturday job I had, but um, <laughs> starting the career. So I I did my GCSEs just about and I failed my A-levels. And I never had any intention of going to university because I knew that I wanted to be a writer and I just wanted to get out and try and make it happen somehow so um whilst working it out I just got a job as a receptionist um to earn money in an office uh, like a serviced office block um I was pretty bad at it I got sacked and um I phoned just for being bad at it well yeah I just was a bit shit like no offense to receptionist it wasn't what I wanted to do like everything until I became a copywriter was just um a stepping stone to making it happen I had no idea how to make it happen so I just really chanced it and got lucky and just told anyone who'd listen that I wanted to be a copywriter so on the day I got sacked I phoned my best friend to tell her and she was off sick that day she worked in a tiny PR agency um, so tiny that her boss the owner of the company answered the phone and she knew that I was my friend's friend and and she said oh she's off sick today can I take a message and I said no I was just calling to tell her I got sacked I'll ring her at home um And she said, do you need work? And I said, yes. Um, And she said, well, we need a hand if you want to come in and be like an office assistant. And they were preparing for the launch of Michael Jackson's Blood on the Dance Floor album. Um, So they were putting a party on. And so I went in for four weeks to 
like I don't know I can't remember like lick envelopes and stuff like that <laughs> um and I got to go to the party um and then after that you know the job was done so she said my husband needs a PA he runs a small advertising agency are you interested and I said yes so um I went over to him and it doesn't exist anymore it was it was tiny and actually it was a direct marketing agency but I didn't know what that was um I didn't understand uh direct marketing or reader offers I'd never studied any of these things but all I knew was the creative director wrote adverts that went in magazines and uh that's what I wanted to do um so I asked Mm. if I could write one which they all found really funny because I'd never written anything before um but because it was a it was direct marketing they could measure the results and the ad I wrote did really well and so they moved me over to um write the reader offers from then on wow do you remember what the ad was for oh my god it's ingrained in my brain um (laughs) it was for a portable this (laughs) it was for a portable dishwasher and washing machine for caravans and it went in caravanning and camping magazine and I thought, oh, my God, I fucking made it. Like, I've hit the big time. And Obviously, since then, I've done really major things. Um, but in that moment, I really thought I was on top of the world. And I was, I just, yeah, I'd made it. Well, all these things are relative, aren't they? So I'm sure, you know, and it is a big thing to see something published and actually get something out there is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. And we shouldn't, um, we should celebrate that. Oh, no, I still do. I've been writing for 23 years now and I still <laughs> pause the TV when my advert comes on like to make my husband watch it. I'm like, look at this. And uh, he makes programs, so his name's going credit. So he's not that like in- excited when he sees a 60 or 30 second ad that I've done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's always been about words then. So as someone who appreciates words so much, and I think it's actually, uh, I suppose it's fair to say that most people I know, certainly of a, you know, of a young age they're sometimes not really too sure what the options are in our industry so the fact that you had that appreciation for words um I would suggest is quite is quite rare I think when you ask most writers um how they got started they all say oh I started reading when I was early uh, sorry started reading when I was younger um or like really young and I did I think I taught myself how to read at sort of two or three I was reading what well, you know nothing big and heavy but um Jane or something um and it just sort of it became a um horrible word it became a passion um for ever and uh, when I went on sort of family holidays I wrote my own stories when I was at college when I did bother to turn up for my media studies course <laughs> I tried making my own magazine it was a um it was sort of meant to rival time out but of course it didn't um and uh, so, yeah, I'd always wanted to when I sort of when I hit 14, 15, 16, I'm not sure. That's when I decided I wanted to write for magazines. I didn't know what copywriter was and I, I didn't understand advertising. So I thought that meant I wanted to be a journalist for magazines. So that was sort of how I um, started carving a path. And in terms of then wanting to write um, specifically for magazines mm. and someone who appreciates w- and, and words so much, how do you feel about images? So, so if the word and the image had a fight, for example, who would win? I feel like there's a right or wrong answer to this, but there's, there's not, is there? It, I don't think... I think if the word and the image fight in an advert, then the advert is wrong. Um, but do you mean like if they both walked into a pub? <laughs> I suppose it's a copywriter versus art director question, really. And I think um, if we make it binary, which, of course, it isn't, as you've already pointed out, then I would expect you to land on the side of the copywriter. But I think if you, as you said, you identified, um, you know, at a young age that you wanted to write and therefore contribute to magazines. When I think of magazines, I think of big, glossy pictures. So it's interesting that it was the words that was the bit you wanted to be behind more so than the than the images well I guess um sort of 25 30 years ago and obviously before that too but I'm just talking about in my lifetime um adverts had more words on them than they than a lot of them do now um if I had the picker who would win the fight probably image because image is universally understood whereas words need translating around the world so in terms of reaching more people, I guess you have more success with images. 
I'm just going to go and shoot myself. <laughs> we don't do that. It's a good answer. <laughs> uh, but so then going back to the writing, so what are the, the most important things to remember when writing? Um, to speak either in the consumer's language or to say something that they're going to be so fucking interested in they can't help themselves but act. You mentioned that um, 20, 30 years ago and, and obviously beyond that the there was more copy in ads. Why do you think that is? And do you think that's a positive thing? Um, do you know, I really don't know. I'm going through a, a long phase at the moment of raiding Dave Dye's website, Stuff from the Loft, and um, reading lots of books by the greats and just researching all the long copy ads. And I haven't worked out yet why copy is not held in the same regard and we're not making ads that look like that anymore um you know like obviously the famous Dave Abbott and Tony Brignall ads and uh like the VW long copy one and the guy lying under a car the Parker pen ad with the pen as the lead image but then just so much copy in the bottom half of the page and I don't know I guess you know everyone says oh no one's got time to read anymore but people are reading all the time if you walk down Mm. the street people's like people's heads are going to fall off they're so bent over (laughs) looking into their phone reading something scrolling words all the time I'm not sure why we're not writing adverts like we used to I don't know if that some agencies have got creative directors that are sort of um they want to be artists and it's more about having a stylized, sexy image with no words littering it. I, I don't know. I think that's certainly true, sadly. Yeah. But I would have thought also with, with long copy ads, certainly there's a compelling argument that I know various names make. I mean, most recently, a wonderful piece shared by um, Tom Roach and the guys at BBH about being distinctive and different. So if you actually were flicking through a magazine and you saw a long copy ad, I mean, that would stand out. And standing out and having that impact is really the first hurdle, isn't it? Yeah, I think you've probably got two types of of reader. Um, So if you saw a long copy ad in a newspaper, probably one type of reader would look at it and, and think, oh, that's too much to read and flick the page. Whereas another reader might think, oh, this is interesting, must be worth reading. Um, if someone's gone to the bother of writing that much I think also the news is so fucking shit at the moment like having a, a nice full page ad to read would be a bit of life like relief yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I agree and then in terms of so 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 back to copywriting in terms of the actual tone of voice I know tone of voice is something well in fact um, you kindly came in I think probably three or four years ago now and you actually ran a wonderful tone of voice workshop here at GAS for, for you know for us here well, firstly, if you can just explain what tone of voice is for anyone listening who's who's unsure. And secondly, is everyone's tone of voice, broadly speaking, just too boring and safe for fear of being different? Um, tone of voice is is brand voice. It's how a brand speaks. It's it's the way that a brand expresses their personality. Um and uh what was the second question? Are most people boring? I I'll just paraphrase. Well, his, his tone of voice about, I think there's, there's, there's a few examples and the, and the usual examples get rolled out at um, various presentations and meetings between agencies and client. But, but, but broadly speaking, there are so few that have that distinct tone of voice. Yes. And is that because people are so risk adverse or they want to sound different, but they're too scared to use the necessary words and tone to be different? I think it's risk averse and um, and scared to stand out, even though they know that they should. So a couple of weeks ago, I wrote, well, earlier this year, I wrote a document called The Bland Book. I don't know if you've seen it. I have, yeah. You worked with, with, with Paul Meller, who's a real kindred spirit of ours for, for many reasons. Yes, we had a brilliant time putting that together. So Paul um, and his partner Jim run Meller & Smith and a sub-brand of Meller & Smith is Take Fucking Risks and they put events on where they have people speaking um, about just you know doing things differently and taking risks and standing out from the crowd. So I knew that he'd be up for it when I contacted him and I said I'm sick of seeing because I I specialize in branding and tone of voice so I see tone of voice documents and brand books all the time and I said to him I'm sick of seeing books that say we're human friendly and honest um Mm. 
because they should be default principles. Brands yeah. should all be, I mean, obviously there are some exceptions like the real maverick brands, but most brands, when you're talking to the consumer, um, an everyday person who's busy and doesn't want to be interrupted by something boring, they want to be entertained or at least find something interesting. Most brands should be by default human, honest, friendly, warm, authentic actually those words don't mean anything when you give them to a designer or a um, copywriter they then there's no weight behind them to to act on it doesn't create a personality or a voice it, it kind of leaves you lost and empty um you know the the best brand books i've seen are ones that really stand for something and i don't mean brand purpose i mean just you know stand for being a character in in a busy competitor landscape you know but you could argue that all the supermarkets sound the same but M&S doesn't sound the same as Tesco and that's because they obviously have a distinctive brand personality and brand voice and then the book that the guidelines that go with that um would inform on that so yeah we wrote the bland book and it was actually so easy because it was just like any other brand book I've seen um that's just sort of mediocre not aspiring to much staying safe and it annoys me that brands think that that's okay because what I don't know why would you want that for your brand? You need to be more, and you need to stand out. We we um we talk about the me too trap here quite a lot with our clients of just being the same as your competitors or the same as the majority in mm. your um, sector. And how on earth do you expect to stand out? And and your point about tone of voice guidelines all saying they're I forget exactly what it was human friendly and honest. Yeah. Our point back to a client in that instance is, well, show me a brand book that says the opposite. Mm. Otherwise, it's entirely pointless, which, again, I suppose is just um, echoing your point. It, it, it's the default. You expect them to be experts or you expect them to be um, innovative or all these other words that get banded about. Unless someone's saying the opposite, then you're not going to stand out. You're falling into that whole me too trap of just being and sounding the same. And it just creates this big wash of beige that isn't memorable yeah well it's funny when you say to a client so you know the alternative to being human friendly is and honest is you're not human you're unfriendly and you're dishonest so <laughs> you're just basically yeah. telling me the obvious um by being mm. by being those things but from now on whenever anybody um contacts me to consult on their branding i'm going to send them the bland book if they tell me they're human friendly and honest and i'll say this is what <laughs> that looks like yeah, you should. You should. I think. Um, I think it's, it's sometimes without being. I don't. I don't mean this, this, and I'm sure you don't mean that to sound too critical of clients either. I think the intention is there, and of course they want going. Going. You know, without dipping too much into the theory around positioning and, and, and recall, they want their target consumer to think of them as human, interesting, and honest. But uh, I'm going to fail not to bre- mention Dave Trot. I think he's come up in every episode so far, but a line of his that I love that again we often repeat is don't tell me you're a comedian make me laugh Mm -hmm. so what they need to be doing is thinking about what words and tone they can take for 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 people who read that to conclude these people are interesting and friendly and honest not just telling people that we're human interesting and honest yeah I just like to pick up on, on the being critical of clients um I'm absolutely not being critical of my own clients. Um, My own clients really excite me because they want to be more than human friendly and honest. And I I see it more as um, I'm not criticizing you if you do want to be human friendly and honest. I'm saying that there's a better way of doing it. So let's work on that. Yeah. Now I've noticed that you're currently reading a big life in advertising i just finished it last night i want i'm disappointed i want it to continue just go back to the start <laughs> i mean there's a few snippets you've shared on twitter that, that really caught my eye because i you know i must confess i haven't read that um but the first one that i think was 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 a gem that i think you shared a couple of weeks ago was that the the only way we could get young people to watch the commercials would be to make them entertaining mm-hmm. people don't seem to get that or don't understand and i've seen a similar statement that is attributed to Walt Disney, I believe, which is, I would rather entertain and hope people learned something than educate people and hope they were entertained. But Mary's point is much more focused and relevant to, I think, one of the the other big challenges that brands face that we've We've, we have touched on in previous episodes, and that's that whole state of indifference, which is you know the default state of a consumer. Consumers don't actually care; they don't, they, don't, they very rarely want to know what you're telling them 
so it's key it's it's really important to be entertaining is that something that as a copywriter you need to be you know very wary of when you when you put pen to paper I don't think you always have to entertain as a copywriter but I think you have to be really relevant to the reader and interesting um I'm lucky to work with entertainment clients so um a lot of my copy has to be entertaining to represent the brand personality yeah you just can't be boring and and whatever iteration that is whether it's entertaining and hilarious or um caring and supportive it's just got to be interesting the other snippet leans towards something i discussed in episode one with with richard shotton um which is the pratfall effect is bill told the world that avis was number two he also told the world that because avis was number two it tried harder and almost overnight avis then became perceived as that threat to um hertz as, which was an awesome act of magic in, in in her words so again as a copywriter and i suppose anyone as a you know who falls under that hat of creative in our industry do you need to be aware of or are you increasingly aware of psychology and and, and heuristics um personally i'm not um having read Mary's book I want my brain to think differently she just seemed to take on every client problem and turn it on its head not with a creative campaign sorry not with a solution via a creative campaign but by just sort of creatively thinking differently and outsmarting the competition um, and telling a story differently to the competition and that's what got her clients noticed and then her noticed I mean I, I can't emphasize how um, much I recommend this book. It's just sort of puts puts me to shame that, you know, I don't think in the same way as, as her. <laughs> it's something to aspire to um, from now on. Um, do I think of the psychology? I think when I'm writing copy, I'm just thinking, and if you call it psychology, fine. I don't really use big words. Um, but uh, all I'm thinking about is what does the reader want to know what do they need to know and what's in it for them because if you can meet all of that criteria you're going to create a reaction hopefully the one that you want which is for them to think feel do act uh, buy uh, click share whatever it is yeah um and for me that is just like I said earlier making sure that you're speaking the customer's language or and or telling them something really fucking interesting yeah, that makes sense. And I think also, um, I think the way you break it down there so simply is 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 important. And I know, again, when I was talking to Richard, I think he recognises the fact that now we call that the pratfall effect, where admitting a weakness makes you more, you know, A, trustworthy and, you know, a bit more alluring, really. But actually, when that line was written, that Avis line, for example, no one had defined it yet as the pratfall effect. So in many ways, it didn't actually exist as a you know, a piece of behavioural science or a piece of psychology or a heuristic, whatever we, you know, define it as nowadays. And that's key. So actually he was he was coming at it and um, Mary's work, they come at it from a different angle and sure there's overlaps into psychology, but psychology isn't the starting point. No, you know what? Funnily enough, that line, we try harder, is human, friendly and honest. Exactly, it, exactly. It wasn't a psychology, it was just, well, maybe it was, but they didn't, like you say, they hadn't named it or coined it that at the time. But it was something that, it was a it was a business change. So it wasn't just a line, it was, it was something that Avis then had to live up to, which they struggled with because they got so much attention um, for putting that out there that when people rented a car with Avis and that it had dirty ashtrays or it wasn't you know, the windscreen wasn't clean or whatever, they said, you're not trying harder. So it was something the company had to live up to. Um, So like Mm. I said, she didn't just um, create creative campaigns as the solution to a company's problems. She changed a company's behaviour. Yeah, and and for people who aren't familiar with with Mary, um, she's billed as the, you know, well, she is the first woman CEO of a company on the New York Stock Exchange. And the the book we've referenced which we'll we'll link to in the podcast homepage um talks of how she shattered every glass ceiling essentially and became a Madison Avenue legend and I should also point out that Mary remains the youngest member to be inducted into the copywriters hall of fame sorry can I just interrupt you because I think that whole Avis blurb that I was banging on about obviously it did come from Burnback um but she 
then later went on to do campaigns very similar um, which had similar effects so sorry I got a bit confused. <laughs> but what do you think Mary would think of the role of women in marketing and advertising today? I mean I know she remains very active currently but you work you do some great things with the likes of she says who's your mama creative equals I think yeah I think she'd be really disappointed because towards the end of her book she says um something along the lines of we're we're getting somewhere but we're not getting anywhere fast enough and I don't know when she wrote the book um it was obviously not yesterday and I think that yeah she would be disappointed because we still are um, very much needing to do a lot of work in those areas. Yeah. So what is the work that you do with the um, the aforementioned three? So they're all networks that are um, doing what they can to change the ratio or balance the ratio at the very least. So with Creative Equals, I run workshops for young female creatives um, with uh, she says is, who's your mama is part of she says so for them um I am a mentor to young female creative um well I try just to mentor copywriters um because that's where I can have the, the most um impact um and the same for for creative girls mentor young female copywriters so sorry I just answered all three separately and I could have just said for all of them I mentor young female <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a very good copywriting technique in real life. So how much mentoring do you do then because I know you're involved with other schools and, and all sorts so so a um well that question <laughs> how much do you do but b how do you find the time? Um well yeah so it takes up a lot of time so last year four creative girls came to me I I didn't know them and they said would you be a mentor and I said yes I, I'm very bad at saying no to things um, especially when um, it's for good causes like that um, or it's something that touches a nerve and I really did have to just tell everybody that like I said earlier I had to tell everybody who'd listened that I wanted to be a copywriter and um, often copywriters don't have a head of copy to look up to or live up to um, who will defend them and support them and inspire them and motivate them and educate them so um, I'm trying to be that person where where I can if somebody wants it so um, I was already working with uh, Creative Equals and Who's Your Mama? And then four creative girls came to me and asked if I would mentor with them. And I said, only copywriters. So they went away and they came back and we said, right, we've got five copywriters that would love to be mentored by you. Here are all their details. Um, please choose who you um, would like to work with. And I said, well, I, I can't possibly choose somebody. Um, how awful. I'll take them all. Um, which... Uh, it's unfair to say I regretted it because I, I don't regret anything um I just sort of thought I hadn't managed my own time or or like you know I, it just wasn't realistic but I just did what I could and I put them first because that you know what's the point of doing it if you're not going to do that um and I did mentor them all um we had monthly sessions for six months um and yeah took up a lot of time but it was good and yeah. you know it, it's made a difference to some of them some of them have got jobs or extra work because of people I've been able to connect them to well done that's brilliant I mean I I'm I've scratched the surface I think that's probably if we're going to quantify what I've done versus you in fact I've hardly even scratched I've maybe tried to scratch the surface but um I personally have found it very rewarding I've done some stuff with the likes of the young enterprise which is not specifically uh, wedded to our industry but I have found that actually surprisingly rewarding for me so firstly your your you know, your intention is to bring value in whatever way you can but I was actually surprised how valuable I found the experience of mentoring yeah it's not um it's not a one-way street by any means um uh, I'm meeting people that I might not have met before and I'm learning things that I didn't know you know I didn't go to uh, so you asked me before about the school. I teach uh, copywriting at the School of Communication Arts in Brixton and I didn't go to ad school or have any kind of advertising, copywriting, marketing training and I get to go in there and meet these brilliant minds in the students that come in but also the, the school runs on uh, a volunteering programme where thousands of people from the industry go in and, and give their time up to give classes or um, set briefs or mentor or give presentations and you know it's a real honor for me to be there let alone um, 
uh, do the teaching. And then that's where I also benefit because I've learned a new skill in speaking to others and helping people find their way without giving them the answer when you know you're working through a brief and that's a very important skill to have especially when you're managing people which I um I do at work yeah yeah and if and if that wasn't enough to keep you busy you also run events so I believe in its first guys it was it was copy cabana um, which is wonderful uh, but that subsequently become copy capital is that right yeah so i created copy cabana with andy maslin a, a leading copywriter in the uk um we were disappointed at the lack of events for copywriters um in the industry when when there's so many other events for other disciplines there was nothing that we wanted to go to as copywriters so um uh, also we wanted to make sure that it wasn't a conference because we thought conference has like a dry connotation to it so we mm. we wanted it to be fun and celebratory we both love our jobs so we wanted um whatever we put on to represent that and to remind people that we're really lucky to do what we do so we called it copy cabana and put it on the beach in bournemouth and that just set it up as something that was going to be really fun um and we did that for two years and we unfortunately had no choice but to move it to London due to um, things that happened <clears throat> with uh, with people that were helping us put it on in Bournemouth. So, yeah, um, yeah we moved it to London and renamed it Copy Capital. And um, I guess it sort of then felt a bit more serious and formal because of its environment and the name. Uh, but we still made sure that, as we had in the previous two years, we had a, a lineup of speakers, 12 speakers, who were either at the top of their game, were industry legends or had jobs that we wish we had or um, represented the industry in a way that nobody else does. So, you know, we were really lucky to have Drayton Bird the first year, Steve Harrison the second year and Faye Weldon last year um, as wow. legends. And um, and then just the lineup. This, I mean, we couldn't believe the speakers that we got. And I guess it was just proof that the event needed to happen, that these people agreed to speak. Um, mm. so we were very lucky and every year it was just a brilliant day. And what was important to us was it was an event that we actually wanted to go to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 presumably this is open to is this open to everybody? It's open it's not everybody. an invite only. That was a sign of success for me, was it wasn't just copywriters coming, it was uh, people from the marketing team or art directors and graphic designers and accounts and HR and and people came from all over the world. Someone came from Q8 last year. I couldn't believe it. Um, so it just went to show that it was a day that was missing from the industry events calendar and that it was, um, it, yeah, it was just well worth the ticket. I mean, I wish that we didn't have to sell tickets. I wish I could do everything for free. Um, but unfortunately, there are logistics that cost money. Um, but unfortunately, it's not happening this year because it is, like you said, where do I find the time? It is so much work. Um and I never wanted to be an event. So I, you know, I only ever wanted to be a copywriter. So by spending six months putting on an event, unfortunately, I'm writing less copy. And, and that's not really how I want to spend my year. But never say never, it might be back. But in the meantime, I'm I'm hosting my Copywriters Unite nights, which are four yes. times a year in London. And they're spreading like wild. They are spreading. I noticed there was one in Bolton the other day, which I believe um, Glenn Fisher hosted. Uh, yeah, uh, Grimsby, yeah. Um, oh, Grimsby, sorry. That's okay, know, but also Amsterdam and Berlin and then, you know, back in the UK. Oh, wow, you've crossed seas. <laughs> um, so it's it's amazing. And again, it just goes to show there are no events in the industry calendar that are like that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so popular. Amazing. Um, so presumably you can't attend all of these. No, I have joked about getting a helicopter and, you know, going right to the UK. <laughs> uh, so I, I go to the London ones. I host the London ones. And have they grown in size? Yeah. So the first one, the first one, actually, I didn't organise. Andy did. Um, so I started the Twitter hashtag Copywriters Unite to connect copywriters around the world. And I can't remember after how long, maybe two years, people were like, we all love each other. We should meet in real life. And I just thought, what? We're introverted <laughs> and we hide behind our computers. This was never meant to be a real life thing. So, what a terrifying prospect. I know. I shied away from the whole thing. I was scared it was <laughs> shit. And I just thought, I'm not doing it. And Andy said, come on, we're doing it. And he organized it and five people turned up. Um, 
but it was really good and it was really nice to meet those five people um and so we did it again um a couple of months later like four months later and um there were about 30 people and since then I don't know I think it was three or four years ago um there's now maybe at the London ones are up to 70 the one in September last year there was about 70 people um and I just couldn't believe it presumably you don't get time to talk to everyone then I try and get around I I come over like I don't know what comes over me it's like I become some neurotic mother that wants to make sure everyone's okay so I do run around a little bit trying to say hello to as many people and also introducing people because it is terrifying for some to turn up to a pub on your own and not know anyone and hope that you recognize someone from their twitter photo um so yeah I do try and connect people and and that's what's the beauty of the event is that when people do connect um lots of brilliant things have happened so people have partnered uh, people have found work people have found mentors um, sometimes creative directors come because they tell me they're looking to hire a copywriter or an art director will come because they're looking to find a partner and you know it's just such a lovely organic like yeah, I come home with a really warm fuzzy feeling god I sound so wet <laughs> 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 not at all not at all but it's like hosting it's like hosting anything like hosting something at your house party at your house or something where you 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 finish the event and you, and you you know people will ask well did you enjoy it but you feel like like you were saying you've been like almost like a neurotic mum yeah just checking in on everyone's having a good time and everyone's got a exactly. drink and well it was my 40th birthday last year and I had a party and my husband was very clear that he was gonna sort of look after the whole thing and when we got home he said I'm exhausted I've never worked so hard yeah. <laughs> making sure that everyone was okay yeah it is, it is exactly that something else that you um you do is uh, you call it copy safari yeah which is um which is wonderful can you explain what what that is and and I would um I would urge everyone to um to check it out and tune in when 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 they're going on. Thank you. Um so I'm really aware of how we all share adverts that we like or don't like or think are effective or not effective on Twitter and a lot of the time there's no context and um that can be you know unhelpful and not constructive. Um and so it just hit me a, a sort of last summer that when I worked at the body shop, we would regularly go out on what we called competitor shopping trips. Um, and we would go around all the other beauty companies and just see what they were up to and what they were writing, what they were making and how they were designing packaging or store design. And I thought, we're always looking at adverts. Well, I say always, sorry. We're mostly looking at adverts and reading copy on our mobiles, which is not how they were intended to be made. So I thought it was important to go out into the wild and see um you know work in windows in on shelves on buses on bus stops billboards and so I called it copy safari and every quarter I invite um people from the industry with me along and we walk up and down the street judging work um not just on whether we like it or not, but is the message right for the brand? Is the execution right for the brand? Does it fit with their brand personality? Is it effective? Who do we think the audience is? So it is a real analysis. Um, on Twitter, it's hard to report back all of that analysis, but it's still a great exercise. And and so when is the next one? The next one is in June with Nick Parker and Sarah Turner. I've got to keep them interested. My last one was with was with them, um, Catherine Wildman, and uh, she was hilarious. She just wanted to go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Did the fee go quiet for a couple of hours then? Oh well, no, I just took photos of her trying sunglasses on and drinking champagne in Melbourne. <laughs> I mean, she is hilarious anyway. Like, if no one knows her, you need to follow her on Twitter and read her um, blog, The Writing Desk, where she interviews copywriters. Um, but you know, we had a brilliant time. But sort of towards the end, because um, she's not from London and she'd come down specially she was like look at all these lovely shops I think though um I mean you mentioned you used to do it at, at the body shop but I think I think actually going out in the streets and seeing ads um in the right context is so important and I know that the guys here when they listen to this episode are gonna shudder when I say the word context because I'm always banging on about actually seeing ads in context because one of the, th the things that that drives me mad is when someone designs or creates something on a screen on their Mac and never even considers the context it will be seen on. And you see it with everything. You see it from, you know, printed 
outdoor media to something that is going to be seen on a particular social media channel and designers so well, it's too easy for a designer or creative of any sort to create something and not even review it on a phone which is where it's going to be seen or or printing it out and seeing it actual size so actually going out on the streets, I think, is a, is a great thing. And I think everyone should be doing that. Yeah, I mean, just even the printing out is important because when you see something on paper on the wall, you like you say, you see it differently to how you see it on the screen. Um, also, it just sort of puts a bit more of the fun back into the job. If you're just hunched over your computer at your desk all day long, you're not sort of getting up and inspiring yourself. Walking along... Um, an agency wall filled with concepts is it just make you just think differently looking at work like that yeah totally and also we agonize over such you know minutiae detail as if as if the ad is always going to be you know framed mm. and hung up in a gallery wall mm. and people are going to come and stare at it but actually the, the reality is people don't want to look at these ads anyway if it's an ad obviously or they might glance at it for two seconds so in those conditions does the ad work if not we need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah. I'd like to put a couple of questions to you, if I may. So asking the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger, but that's not stopped us asking our listeners for questions to put to you. So starting with Lee, who is studying marketing comms with advertising at Bournemouth University. Lee asks, who should aspiring copywriters study to learn their craft? Um... The who is difficult to answer. The what is easier. So Lee should um, drown himself or herself. Is is Lee male or female? <laughs> I've assumed Lee is is a is a chap, but that might not be true. So let's just let's just let's just put this out to all aspiring copywriters. Okay. Um, get inside the DNA D copy book um there there's a new version it came out last year it's about 15 quid and that is the least amount of money you'll ever spend on the biggest lesson in copywriting um it's hundreds of pages written by um you know the some of the biggest and most awarded copywriters in the world with their work um included so uh, each chapter they talk about their approach to copywriting and then the following pages have examples and I mean, you just couldn't have a better book to keep on your shelf. Equally, 15 quid, that's brilliant. Um, One of our account managers here spent 19 quid on a gin and tonic apparently the other night. So, well, much better, much, sorry, much, much better well spent. Well, that, I just, I'm a much better writer than I am speaker. I think I say that whenever I do an interview. It's so embarrassing that I can't speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, the DNA D copy book um, is a must have. Um, I would also recommend Steve Harrison's How to Write Better Copy. That is a lesson in conversational copywriting in two hours. I read it in two hours. Um, any book written by a copywriter is a, a, a really brilliant read um, because copywriters write conversationally most of the time. Um, mm. As for who to learn from, uh, I mean, you've mentioned him already. I always mention him, Dave Trott. Um, I read his latest book, Creative Blindness, um, in a whole weekend, and that was a masterclass on just creative thinking. Um, but as for who, I don't know. I guess follow the Copywriters Unite hashtag. I know that sounds like a plug for myself, but it's not. It's for copywriters using it and sharing work and blog posts and articles, and you know that's that's always a good place to learn. Well, thanks for that answer. And um, another... Um copywriter Claire has asked what do you think of emojis is Claire male or female <laughs> I'm joking <laughs> um <laughs> being stupid um what's the question something about emoji what do I think about emojis? yeah what do you what do you think of emojis I think they are not a replacement for copy in advertising okay sorry McDonald's I, yeah, I mean, Claire probably doesn't care what my answer is to this question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. I think they're, I used to think they're horrible little things, um, but I think I know for a fact, because everyone keeps telling me, that the older I get, the more cynical and grumpy and just generally a bit of an arse I become. But I've, I've learned to actually appreciate them in some instances because, uh, you know, everything evolves, doesn't it? So, so language, words, everything evolves. What I don't like, and it was, um, you know, is where you see them used um irresponsibly Stephen Colgan I know he certainly wasn't a fan of the emoji movie so that's something that should never have happened clearly I think we can all agree on that but I think in certain instances 
you know, emoji, emojis play a part. But as I said, Claire doesn't probably doesn't care what I think, but I've had to answer it anyway. So um, yeah, I guess everything has its place. Um, I just emojis don't have a place in advertising for me. Good stuff. Well, it's a strong answer. You're not on the fence, which is good, <laughs> which is good. We want to rid the beige and the, you know, the grayscale. So that's great. Um, and then the the final part of the interview, Vicky, is we have uh, what we call our four pertinent poses that we that we put to all of our guests. So here are the usual questions. So number one, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, I really, I don't know. Um, I, <laughs> number two. <laughs> I don't know because I don't know that I would have or could have done anything differently. Um when I was younger um I'm I'm pretty well I'm absolutely positive that when I was younger I would not have changed my path into work for going to university and going to advertising school because I'm hard working and I'm determined and I'm ambitious and I was all of those things at a younger age and university and ad school to me were just things that got in the way of getting on the the, the ladder um so, yeah, I don't think I would have done anything differently um, when I was younger, but maybe I would have liked to have been a bit more, uh, I don't know, I sounded really like ballsy and confident in what I just said, but, you know, anybody young has uh, does lack confidence, so a bit nervous. I suppose it would be nice to get rid of all of that anxiety that gets in the way. Um, but I think just be careful who you trust also. I've I've uh, maybe not, I've maybe trusted people I shouldn't have Um and that's come to, you know, burn me a bit. Um, okay. And then the other thing is, I would say, is just take any fucking opportunity that comes your way, because better to try something than regret not trying it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd go everywhere and do everything and work hard and be nice to people. I'm basically quoting Anthony Burrell Prince. Um it, he uh, so much so I actually I wrote a marketing society article um, using his uh, prints as the headlines for each of my points so um I'll send that to you okay yeah great I, I mean I'd second that absolutely because I, I we're I'm constantly telling people to just you know what's the what's the same fail fast and move on I think what holds people back in life you know outside of work just in general in life is that fear of failure so actually just throwing yourself into things saying yes more and trying things is really what separates successful people or people you perceive as being successful to people that that don't necessarily achieve what they want to. I think the, in fact, this is very pertinent because my nephew, um, or one of my nephews yesterday found out he was unsuccessful in a job interview. Um, and he responded brilliantly. He's just throwing himself back into more, which is great. But I think it's so easily he could have taken that news really badly and maybe shied away from another opportunity. And I think that's key. So I think that's a great answer. Yeah, just don't think too much. Just do it. Yeah, don't think too much. Yeah, absolutely. That's another one. Again, I'll keep adding. I'll have to edit this out of me just wanging on about stuff but I read something a while ago about lifeguards so when you see lifeguards at you know swimming pools specifically not lifeguards on the beach because I think they have a much um, more party-like lifestyle or they certainly do on tv but if you're a lifeguard at a swimming pool you're you're significantly more likely to suffer from mental health issues because you're you're probably sat there with very very little to do just thinking too much so I'm all for thinking but yeah as you say if you do it too much it can be detrimental so question two, if you could banish one thing from the industry, what would it be and why? Can I have more than one thing? Uh, yeah, if they're good enough. You're like, no, answer the fucking question. <laughs> um, yeah, go on, go for it, go for it. I don't know, uh, buzzwords for a start. Um, everyone needs to stop talking shit and just, you know, be, be normal, um, yes. whatever normal is. Um, things like unrealistic deadlines and tight timings like hardly any piece of work needs to go out yesterday can we all have a bit more time to chill out think better and and stronger and more efficiently and and maybe we would have you know lots of people complain about there not being good work out there it's because we're all racing to the finish line um if we had more time like I wrote an ad last week and it had to go immediately and then yesterday I thought of a much better headline for it and I know you know, you can't always have a week or a month or whatever, but just sometimes that would be nice. Also, can we get rid of dickheads? There are lots of dickheads in the industry. <laughs> um, Law of averages, they get everywhere. <laughs> that's true. There are lots of dickheads in the world. But, yeah, if we could all just stop, like, 
believing the hype and playing the game and being disrespectful and and just well yeah let's let's have a, a world that's a better place to be and then maybe advertising would be a better place to be although I have to say I love advertising I don't want to put a down on it I love my job and I love the industry likewise um, and number three, you've already you've already um, recommended a few, which is fantastic. So number three is actually any books that you would recommend. So if there are any others, then um, now's the time to share them. Otherwise, we can um, we can skip on. Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, so all of Andy Maslin's books on copywriting, I would um, read, and then all the like really cool people from yesterday's advertising. So George Lois, Paul Arden, Bob Hoffman, the Mary Wells book we've discussed anything by Faye Weldon. Um, I'm not sure she's actually written a book on advertising, but her novels are just a real representation of her character. And she is an incredible woman. Um, And I'd start with her autobiography um, to understand her experience as a copywriter at Ogilvy in the 50s. Okay, fantastic. Well, we'll put all these links on um, on the episode homepage. So the the last question, Vicky, is we, we always like to dedicate each episode each show to somebody um and we ask our guests to do that um and give their reason why so um over to you vicky well as you've noticed with the wordplay i couldn't make a decision easily and with (laughs) you've just asked me i haven't been able to give one answer so i'm not dedicating this to one person i'm dedicating it to one person and one place um the person is Ali Hannon of creative equals because she just doesn't get the support or the recognition that she needs and deserves um so my call to action if I can is that um everyone looks her up signs up for the creative equals kite mark for their agency and books tickets to her conference next month she is working her arse off and has done for um I think the last four years on creative equals um and um yeah she you know we should all be behind it I can't believe she has to fight so hard to make change happen it should just be a no-brainer and then the other place that uh also I would like people to support is the School of Communication Arts because in order to have a diverse um industry we need to have um a diverse student intake and that often needs funding and the school offers scholarships but it needs the money to offer those scholarships so if agencies could support that as well um we might all get somewhere faster like Mary Wells Lawrence would like us to brilliant so as as a, as a final call to action to add to that one if if you've enjoyed the episode head over to our podcast homepage wherever as i say we'll share links to everything that we have discussed in the last hour but how else um can people get more vicky ross um well i'm blabbering away on twitter quite a lot um at vicky ross writes um and then the hashtag copywriters unite is um where you can find lots of other copywriters you don't have to follow me you can just follow the hashtag and find others and and you're you're talking soon aren't you is it in mumbai yeah (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah so uh yeah, that yeah. I don't like flying. I don't like public speaking. But I say yes to these things. Um, I think I wow. earlier I'm not very good at saying no. But for me, it's just um, that there wasn't another copywriter on the lineup, and I just always want to make sure that copywriting is part of the conversation. It doesn't have to be me that's the speaker. But um, if 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 I'm the only one that's asked at the moment, then I'll just do it. I'm going to write my talk this weekend. It's called "The Robots Aren't Coming," and I'm doing that at a tech and media and marketing conference so that should be interesting oh brilliant brilliant and is that without um any spoilers is that just you know a cheeky elbow to those who claim ai is the answer to everything in advertising yes i'm going to prove it wrong in copywriting fantastic well thank you so much for joining us vicky it's been um, a pleasure an absolute pleasure to talk to you again thank you very much And finally, thank you to everyone who's willingly let their ears be bent by us for the last hour or so. Uh, And thank you to everyone who's left amazing reviews since the last episode with Ian. They are hugely appreciated. A special shout out to Chris Grimes, who described the pod as a reservoir of gold. Um, So thank you, Chris. If you want to get in touch with the show and have your questions answered in upcoming episodes, please get in touch via Twitter or email the show at hello at calltoaction.co. I can't get no call to action. I can't get no call to action.
call to action But I try, and I try, and I try, and I try Yeah!